Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. My name is Neil Selwyn and I'm hosting this online symposium, Datification of Schools and Schooling. So many of the audience today are in Europe, but a lot of us are coming to you from Australia, where the event is being hosted by Monash and Deakin Universities. Australia has a shameful colonial history. So first off, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this online event from the unceded lands of the Kulin Nations and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Monash is on the lands of the Boonarong people, and I'm currently on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various other lands on which a lot of us are working today. And I also want to particularly acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are participating in this webinar. So this is a chance to come together to talk about all things datification and schools. Data has become a huge issue in education today. Digital technologies have become an even bigger issue in education today. And we're interested in what happens when you put the two together. So we know that schools are full of digital technologies these days, learning management systems, a laptop for every student, video streaming, Google Classroom. The pandemic really brought home the fact of how digitally dependent our schools and schooling have become. But at the same time, schools are under increasing pressure to make use of data, to become data informed, to engage in data driven decision making and generally take notice of data to make sense of where they and where their students might be heading. Now, there are lots and lots of different types of data swirling around the school system. We've got in, international kind of standardized indicators like OECD's PISA tests. Every system has national tests. In Australia, we have NAPLAN. We also have end of school examinations, the A-levels, the VCEs, GPA scores. We also have all of the data being collected by school systems and school districts from attendance data to dropout rates, post-school destinations. We're increasingly making our students fill in student satisfaction surveys, parent satisfaction. There's so much data being generated outside schools. And there's also so much data being generated within schools, particularly by teachers to guide their own teaching. But in addition, we also have a rise of software and other platforms and other systems which monitor and measure how students are learning. Data dashboards, learning analytics, student activity monitoring software. And also another layer, the data that's constantly being generated every time we use our devices and every time we use our platforms, the trace data that's being collected by the likes of Google and Zoom and then sold on to third parties. So there are lots of different possibilities, lots of different potential and also lots of different problems associated with this rise of data in schools, especially when data has been generated, processed and circulated through our digital technologies. So that's the focus of today's event. And we've got together three sets of researchers who are empirically investigating the ways in which schools are actually dealing with the increased datification of their technology-based practices. So I'd like to introduce Juliana Yark from the University of Graz. She's just moved there. And Irina Zarakova from the University of Bremen. And they've been carrying out some fantastic work on the datification of German schools. We've got Lucy Pangrazio from Deakin University and Bronwyn Cumbo from Monash University who've been doing the same thing in Australian schools. And last of all, we have Lindsay Grant from the University of Bristol in the UK. And she was one of the OG researchers in this area, doing a, a PhD way back in the 2010s in ethnography of, of English schools. So altogether, we've got the best bunch of people I think we can to talk about where data and datification schools is heading. So just before the three research teams start off, just a few house rules. Keep yourself on mute. We want you to ask questions, make comments and feedback along the way. So please use the Q&A chat function whilst each team are talking. And I'll try and collate the questions and comments and feed them back for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And at the end of all three presentations, we'll have a much broader discussion. So please use the chat function and ask any questions, any comments, however stupid you might think they are. We are recording this session and we also have a professional illustrator who's based in the UK, Jenny Leonard, waving there down the bottom. And she's going to be doing a live illustration of the event as we go along. And we might dip in and out to see how visually things are looking. So feel free to have your cameras off. We'll be finishing at 8.30 sharp Melbourne time, which I think is 10.30 sharp UK time. I could be wrong about that. If not before, we don't want to outstay our welcome. But anyway, let's get started. And to begin with, we've got Juliana and Arena. 
Juliana was a co-editor of a special issue of Learning Media and Technology, I think in 2019 on datafication with Andreas Breiter. And I'd really recommend reading that. I'd really recommend reading the editorial where they talk about what does datafication mean. If you want a, a kind of primer, a 101 on this topic, that's a really good paper to start reading. And they've also been involved in a datafied schools project on schools in Germany. So over to you, Juliana. Thank you so much, Neil, for the introduction. Um, Irina is going to share her screen and we're going to do that together, our talk. Okay, so what we would like to talk um, in our 15 minutes is about educational technologies, data infrastructures and the construction of good schooling through educational um, data. And what we'll be doing today, next slide, please is to consider how um, schooling is uh, constructed and configured through datafied education, through datafied um, technologies, um, and to specifically talk about the project that Neil just mentioned, which was called Datafied, Data Forward in Education, that just finished um, a few months back. Uh, we report on one particular um, aspect um, that we've explored in the project, and that is to use um, um, care epistemologies to think about the datafication of education and then make some suggestions for future research. And to start off, we'd like to, next slide, um, to emphasize that the future of data fight education or any future, in fact, is not simply happening, but it's something that is made. And it's made through expectations, imaginaries, visions, and hypes that shape discourses and define what's thinkable and what's desirable. And futures are also made through technologies that structure social relations and shape and co constitute our world. So just to give you a brief example, this is a picture um, of 120 years ago about the future of uh, schooling um, and the idea that technology enables um, a delivery basically of better, more personalized education. Um, next, click next. Um, which is a picture of uh, 60 years later, an illustration, a Japanese vision of the future classroom, where again, you can see through technologies, children are being um, educated in a more personalized um, way. And these visions have been taken up next um, by um, diverse groups of people, in particular education technologies providers and developers, um, to develop um, technologies that may contribute to um, better schooling and better education. So along with education theories about individual learning styles, we see a lot of ed tech providers developing technologies that support um, learning and teaching and the organization of um, schooling. Um, next. Uh, this is an example of a learning management system, which is something that we were particularly interested in called Brightspace, which aims to support uh, teachers in the delivery of, um, um, of their um, content next. Um, and then you can click next three times. And it promises to save teachers, no, <laughs> sorry. It promises to save uh, teachers um, time to do what they love and care about, to motivate students and to keep students on track with inbuilt analytics. So these kinds of systems basically collect vast amounts of data about um, students, their engagement with uh, different types of content of these, uh, on these platforms, and then use them to um, basically provide analytics um, to teachers about learning progress, risks of failure, um, and um, socio-emotional learning. Next, please. However, what we can also see now is that uh, despite the increasing enthusiasm about these kinds of technologies and their uh, contribution to uh, the future of uh, learning, more and more schools are actually being aware um, about um, the ways in which these kinds of technologies um, collect vast amounts of data about um, students. Um, next, please. And here are just some, um, some quotes from that article where teachers say that they don't want um, any of these big tech providers to use data about children because they don't know what these data are being used for. Next, please. Um, and they don't understand where the data is going from Google and what Google basically does with these kinds of data. So this is, yeah, next, please. 
So what's happening in more and more countries, and this is an example from Spain, is that they're developing their own software in order to provide alternatives um, and alternative technologies to, for example, dominant players such as Google and Microsoft. Next, please. So what we can see um, just by this brief um, illustration is there is a rising tension about the future of um, good schooling, of education, and what role technology may play in that next. And on the one hand, we have educational um, technologies and educational technology providers uh, that provide data-driven solutions to what they would call educational problems next. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, educators, but also critical education researchers that um, um, basically are worried about the ways in which educational technologies pose a problem to good educational futures. Next. So in our project, we were really interested in understanding um, the role of educational technologies and data infrastructures in the construction of good schooling. So how is good schooling differently constructed and configured through educational technologies and data infrastructures? And to explore that question further, um, we've conducted a three-year project called Data Fight, Data for and in Education, which looked at four different interfaces of the school educational system. One looked, um, I think you need to click, yeah, one looked at the changes in which school administration, monitoring and leadership um, changed through datafication and database systems, and that was done by colleagues in Hamburg. Um, our part was to look at the ways in which school management and school organization um, change and transform through datafication. And then we had two more projects, one looking at the ways in which um, teaching um, and uh, learning changed uh, through learning, um, so, uh, so learning software, educational software, and then a fourth project which looked at the ways in which the relations between teachers and students change as well as teaching and learning. Um, and I hand over to Irina, who will be talking about specific results from the project. Yeah, thank you, Juliana. And um, within these four instances and interfaces of the school education system, we did uh, mostly an interview based study. And it is um, the data here on the slide is specific to our part. We um, conducted interviews and empirical research in four federal states of Germany in eight public uh, schools from K-12 education in cities, but also more rural regions. We, um, in each of the federal states, they used different school management information systems, which we were interested in. And we also, because of that, we also talked to designers of these school management information systems, which at least in our case in Germany, were also based within the ministries of education of the federal states or lender. And um, what we are going to talk about in the remainder of this talk is um, the attention to care as a practice and disposition towards, call, uh, towards good schooling. And this is um, what we also published in our recent paper in the journal Learning Media and Technology called Educational Technologies as Matters of Care. And in this article, we discuss how the feminist concept and ethics of care can help to think differently about the role of digital technologies and data in teaching and learning practices. Specifically, we show how various school actors, such as school administration, like school principals and secretaries, but also teachers, work and care with, for, and against technologies and data on the everyday basis. Our empirical research here shows a more complex picture rather than what Juliana showed before, there's this tension and polarization between educational technologies as either solutions or problems. So before I continue on that, I would like to first focus on the ethics and concept of care. So as an analytical lens, we chose feminist ethics of care specifically developed by Joan Toronto, which was extensively discussed in her uh, 1993 published book, Moral Boundaries. These ethics of care allow to explore educational technologies and schoolings from multiple perspectives. First of all, care can be understood both as a normativity and a practice. Um, 
And this normativity is what Toronto calls a disposition. So teleaffective motivations guiding these practices. So for Toronto, care is about maintenance, continuing and repair, which aim to make world as good to live in as possible. And um, acknowledging multiplicity of subject and object positions in different practices, feminist ethics of care also allow to capture diverging or conflicting dispositions both among different actors and also among different roles one actor may hold. In that sense, care is also about answering the question, a world good to live in for whom and why, and um, why I was trying to achieve this good to live in world. So by analyzing different practices of maintenance and repair that according to Toronto aim to make world as good to live in as possible, we can explore how exactly various dispositions differ. And lastly, Toronto also argues that care is distributed unequally. So different actors may be engaged in partial practices of care. And although Toronto did not explicitly exclude, include um, non-human actors in her ethics of care, they were not um, they were not really prioritized in her approach. So in order to kind of include the non-human actors, we also built our research on a rather post-humanist analysis of technology and care and turned to perspectives developed, for example, by Maria Puchdela Balakasa, such as uh, in her book, uh, Matters of Care. And particularly also to the notion of the care arrangement, which was introduced by Criado and Rodriguez Geralt. And they propose, quote, an analytic shift toward thinking in terms of care arrangements, where care is not only seen from a bodywork perspective, that is, we usually invisible physical labor that caregiving entails, but from a broader perspective, where care work appears as distributed among people and things, and where delegations of tasks to things are also noted, end quote. Hence, our research, in our research, we understand schools as care arrangements, where care is located not only in the relations between teachers and students, but also distributed across all involved human and non-human actors. So what does it mean empirically then? This is um, one of the central findings that we present in our article, and this is how we expanded uh, John Tronto's framework of uh, feminist uh, ethics of care um, in the sense that they added the roles, different technologies and data in education in the care arrangement of school play. And um, the visualization on the one side shows how in the care arrangement of a school, technologies are primarily used for caregiving and care receiving, meaning respectively that technologies are involved in the performing of an act of care or are used to give a response to provided care. As a care can be distributed among different actors. According to Toronto, we distinguish here between school information systems designers, which play a role of ed tech providers, so to say, then also school actors and policy makers as human actors involved in the care arrangements. And our findings show that school information systems can either be viewed as antagonists, intermediaries, means to receive care or recipients of care distributed to different degrees among the involved actor groups. And these first two roles, um, the system as an antagonist and system as intermediary, overlap with the currently dominant academic discourses. Again, what Juliana presented before about technologies in education discussed as either solutions or problems. Um, but the latter roles, such as means to receive care and systems of recipients, illustrate more complex relations. For example, um, some school actors in our sample deliberately used data which we knew were representing their school in a bad way during the pandemic in order to receive additional attention and ultimately help from the ministry. And this is what we call here data and technologies as means to receive care. Similarly, on the other, in other instances, school actors need to specifically care for their data for example, update and maintain them regularly because ultimately many decisions about the school, like also future funding, depend on the data and technologies. And this is what we here call system as recipient of care or data as recipient of care. And to conclude, where does a careful approach to ed tech lead us now? So 
First of all, we think that careful approach allows to turn academic attention not only to negative critical examples of data and technology usage for education, which are still quite important to discuss, but we think that this careful lens also draws attention to the positive examples of school life with technologies and data. It goes beyond the so-called so -called best practices. Rather, it is about the manifold and way of ways in which various school actors deal with technologies and data on the everyday basis and live and survive with data and sometimes also against them. Secondly, a careful lens allows to attend to the dark sides of care. It means to the situations where intentions to care for educational actors lead to the opposite results. And instead of receiving care, educational actors become subject to restrictive policies and practices. And similar work is being done by, for example, educational governance scholars who show how some data fight educational governance policies and initiatives that promise teachers more autonomy, let's say, or more time for individual engagement and support for students result actually in the opposite. And the careful lens we propose here allows to attend to the controversies and contradictions of a manifold of such promises, both from the governance and policy institutions, ed tech providers, and also within education organizations themselves. And we think it can foreground how contested perspectives on what is care in education and what should be cared about coexist. And finally, a careful lens on ed tech and educational data may also lead to future changes, especially combined with participatory and feminist methodologies. It can pave ways for action and policy change as it points out positive examples of living with data in the dark negative sides of some careful initiatives at the same time. And with that, we are at the end of our talk and thank you very much for your attention. That was excellent. Thanks ever so much. If you could hear all the applause, I'm sure there'd be lots, but that, that was really, really interesting. And a really, really good example of using kind of quite nuanced theoretical approaches to kind of shine a light on the kind of ambiguities and contradiction of data. Data is not wholly bad. Data is not wholly good. Data is kind of very contradictory. So that was fantastic. Do put any questions or comments or queries you have in the chat and we can feed them back to, to the research team. I guess just a few questions that have come up so far. And I guess the first one is, is the the standard question of what is new here so you've got digital technology impl implicated in schools care relation care arrangements i'm just wondering was the digital technologies in the schools you researched reflecting schools existing care arrangements so in other ways was, was digital technology just allowing the same kinds of care work and care relations to take place or what was the digital technology and the data-driven technology shaping different forms of, of, of relations different form of care and I guess my final question would be, is there a way that we could perhaps use data-driven technologies to lead to more beneficial, meaningful actions and, and, and ways that care could take place? So three three-folded question. What's new here? Was data doing anything different? But could we use it perhaps to kind of uh, make schools better places? Um, sure, I'll start, Julia. And I think I'll start with the second question because I think that's uh, for us, at least based on our empirical research, uh, the, the easier one. Um, so I think data definitely changed something in particular because data becomes something that needs to be cared for in order to care for the school. So they are ultimately the thing that need to be cared for in order to show that how schools performing, in order to show that school either needs help or it is quite good and would like to, um, you know, for example, receive more, more funding or more resources, let's say. So um, data just become an additional thing, let's say here to care for besides the students, besides the staff. So of course, in that sense, it also takes some space from the care or that takes something from the resources people and school actors have to care for everything else. And it can result also in sometimes, sometimes they can kind of not care for data and then instead choose to care for themselves or for the colleagues, for the students, but sometimes they cannot. And then some, it may result in also, yeah, at least for a couple of weeks when in Germany, they are really, um, um, strongly involved in um, working with data and the annual statistics that say then they don't have time for for other things and and this notion i guess of caring for data presumably involves huge amounts of um, hidden labor 
Yes. So who is doing this labor and is it being kind of rewarded or um, using the feminist analysis? Presumably it's not. It's it's just extra work. Yeah, 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 it definitely is so. And that's also what we what we often hear from from the people that it's actually and this promise of educational technologies and software to kind of relieve people from additional work often actually doesn't pay out in this sense that it's actually more work to care for the data because they have to be cared for on a daily basis if you don't want to then uh, have a lot of work uh, at the end of the year, let's say. Juliana? Yeah, if, I'm, yeah, if I may add to this, thank you, Irina. It's really, I, I think it also plays into this um, dominant discourse about data just, you know, being the new oil that just flows around without any extra work and labor. And in particular, if you take the ministries of education view, for example, that think, you know, whatever data comes out of the school is just, you know, a byproduct of processes that are happening anyway, and then just flowing into their databases. And what we've um, tried to reconstruct is all then is also then all this kind of work towards making data actually move and translate from different contexts. And that has a lot to do with a lot of the invisible labor that you've just talked about. So a lot of that labor towards translating data to make it meaningful to other educational actors, to make it actually move between different types of infrastructure is completely invisible and is like, um, dominant and also official accounts of um, uh, educational data infrastructures. Yeah, no automated technology is really automated. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like this, exactly. A couple of questions just in the chat before we move on to uh, Lucy and Bronwyn. Um, I don't know if you actually kind of, this was part of your research team, but you mentioned that you've been working with and researching designers of school management systems. So that's a really interesting bunch of actors to be talking to. Presumably they wield a lot of power. What did these people see themselves as doing? And what were these people's conceptions of what good schooling and good education was about? I think yeah. in terms of what they see themselves doing is that in our case, they actually saw themselves as intermediaries between the ministries and policymakers and schools because they... As, seated in the ministry and they also have some sort of power over schools but at the same time they at least try to work also closely with school actors and know the a bit maybe even a bit more about everyday practices of schools sometimes at least and uh, they try to kind of mediate between the policy expectations from the ministries and the actual reality of school you know and, uh, yeah, now the interesting bit in Germany is that um, education is um, organized and by, any, by the federal states. So we have 16 federal states and basically each of the federal states has their own Ministry of Education, which develops their own uh, management um, information systems for schools. So they are very different, which was really interesting for us also to see how they implement, you know, policies differently in different technologies. And uh, towards the end of the project, we had a workshop with um, school information systems designers from different federal states, and that was super interesting to see also how they then talk to each other and, as Irina said, really understood themselves as um, intermediaries, like trying to find good solutions for um, yeah, enabling good educational futures, as we said. So everybody really is interested in enabling these yeah, enabling and facilitating good schooling. And they were really aware of the ways in which also those technologies then configure certain practices within schools and restrict certain ways of um, organizing schooling or not. So that was really, uh, really interesting as, as they are not just, you know, some, some technocrats developing their solutions outside of the context, but really trying to make, make it work better for schools. Yeah, absolutely. A really interesting kind of level of actors. Now, we've got one minute left and a really simple question that's come up in the chat, but I'll ask you anyway. This um, your, your application of feminist theory and feminist notions of care is really interesting. And this, you know, the idea of care being a really important part of, of digital education came to the fore during the pandemic, where we all realized digital education is relational. 
looking at, I mean, there's been a big rise in, I mean, the data feminist book that came out a couple of years ago has made a big kind of storm. So, I mean, what do you see as really useful from this whole kind of data feminist turn for education researchers moving forward? Are there particular ideas, questions, methods, approaches, dispositions that you would, you would point to? Hmm. Yeah, I think certainly, um, it, 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 it's certainly looking at power relations and examining power relations between different types of educational actors and their, let's say, stake in um, configuring educational futures and educational um, technologies. And then in particular, any feminist thought thinking about invisibilities and visible, you know, invisible, visible work, et cetera. And then, but also to some extent, the ways in which our research then makes certain work visible, which probably shouldn't be visible at all. So then, you know, we were also quite, in particular, for example, the secretaries, right? And the work of secretaries is, is something that hasn't really received much attention in educational research, in particular, in relation to educational technologies. And that's something that we found really interesting as well, because in the dominant, pers you know, um, and official records, you never really see the secretariat uh, taking any roles, whereas, if you look at it um, on the ground, you see they, yeah, you know, <laughs> there is a lot of work and labor, actually invisible labor, to make these infrastructures running. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, the work that we've done shows secretaries entering data into systems on behalf of parents that don't speak English, for example, or other vulnerable families, fiddling the figures around. It, you know, really, really important intermediaries. Yeah. There's a couple of other questions in the chat, which I don't know if you've got a chance to attend to typing wise, but we're going to multitask now and move on to uh, Lucy Pangrazio and Bronwyn Cambo. So thanks ever so much for, for that input. And we'll come back to everyone together at the, the, the final Q&A. Um, so secondly, we've got Lucy Pangrazio and Bronwyn Cumbo. They're part of the Data Smart Schools team, an ARC funded project, which has also been taken three, three and a bit years, looking at data and datafication in Australian schools. So over to you, Lucy and Bronwyn. Thanks, Neil. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm uh, coming to you from tonight, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and yeah, just just uh, on the question of care, listening to Irina um, and Juliana, it was um, we've done some work talking to students, and it's really interesting thinking about how they experience, you know, data and their feelings about data as well. So, what is perceived as care is often not um, experienced as care. I'm going to share my uh, screen with you because we're going to talk about something a little bit different tonight. Okay, so Bronwyn and I are going to share some findings and thoughts from the Data Smart Schools project. Um, and this project is led by Neil, but it also includes Michael Henderson and Dragan Gazovic, um, and of course Bronwyn. And we're in the last year of the four year project. Um, and we've been working with three quite contrasting secondary schools in Victoria and trying to really understand how they do data. So one strand of this research has really looked at the data infrastructures in the schools and specifically the platforms um, in each of those schools as well. And the project really worked in kind of two phases. So the first phase was really about trying to understand what was going on in the school. Um, and then the second phase was working with students and teachers in the school to really work out how we could do data better. So I'm gonna do the first part of this presentation and talk about what we found in phase one um, in relation to data infrastructures. And then Bronwyn is gonna take up the reins and um, speak to phase two. So in this part of the project, we really wanted to examine um, the platforms in our three schools and how they're shaping and reshaping school processes. And of course, we know there is a very, um, close relationship between platforms and data. And after all, platforms are really integral um, to generating and formatting that data. So essentially they do work in tandem. Now we follow a lot of the theoretical literature um, on platformization. And while we sort of expected to see um, three platformized schools, and we really did see that, I guess the nature of platformization was quite different perhaps to what we expected. Um, but before I tell you about that, I just want to talk a little bit about the theoretical frame that we used. So to theorise platforms in schools, we used infrastructure studies 
and as many of you likely know, infrastructure studies is concerned with the close investigation of the pervasive and enabling resources that assist the flow of information um, within an organisation. So in this sense, we're looking at resources, um, not just the physical infrastructure like the wires and tubes, but also the social and organisational dimensions as well, such as the people, the routines, you know, the classificatory systems and the protocols um, of those schools. So um, to do this, we conducted in-depth semi-structured interviews that lasted between 30 um, and 90 minutes with um, staff at the schools. And in addition to that, technical staff sketched out data maps showing their understandings of the different platforms and systems in the school and how they interoperate or not as the case may be. Um, and we also do research or walkthroughs of the schools to identify the features in the built environment that helped the data um, infrastructure in the school, uh, helped help to provide data in, in throughout the school. Um, so what do we find? The schools um, were really composed of a patchwork of platforms stitched together by a lot of human labour, um, which is something that's already coming up. Um, and this really highlights a number of underlying socio-technical conditions under which these schools now operate. These include limited technical interoperability and differences between the educational requirements um, and the commercially led designs of that tech in the schools. Um, and also really apparent was um, this dis disjuncture between the imagined benefits and the ongoing behind the scenes maintenance and re repair work that's really required to keep those infrastructures going. So just an example of this, um, this is a legend for the different types of data infrastructures that we found in our three schools. And you can see here, there's a lot going on. And we looked at actually the three different systems of schooling in Victoria, the private, Catholic and government schools. And there were sort of some differences emerging in within those systems. But you can see here, we've got software for school management, for interacting with parents, but then a whole lot of other software that's really about making those systems run. So mirroring platforms, converging data, um, basically stuff to make the other stuff work. So this is the map that we created for one of our schools, um, Brookdale College. Um, and it was the private school in, um, in our uh, sample. Um, and as you can see, Brookdale here had multiple systems to just monitor and network at the, and manage the data. So for example, it was using both ClearPass and Active, Active um, Directory to connect devices to the network. It had three systems for converging data to streamline the, the infrastructure. So it had Hapara, Octopus, BI and um, Casync. And uh, Octopus BI is a business analytic analytics platform. So we can really see here um, a clear example of something that was kind of developed for the business sector, then sort of repackaged and inserted into a school. And we saw many um, examples of this um, in our mapping. Now, much of the kind of complexity within um, Brookdale's data infrastructure was really due to making different parts of this system work. Um, and in particular, it was really about fulfilling the kinds of um, demands and perceptions of different stakeholders. And as this was a private school, it was mainly about the demands and perceptions of the parent body. Um, and that led to quite kind of complex and niche sort of software solutions. Um, so it really was a case of kind of acquiring technology to, fill, to fulfill more niche needs, but then also additional technology to make that work. And, and several technicians, you know, talk to this, talk to us about this um, need for hyperconvergence um, to help simplify this process and make it easier to kind of manage and back up the, the life cycle of the software. So before I hand over to um, Bronwyn, I just wanted to finish up with a kind of few questions that were emerging from uh, phase one. Um, now each um, of the school's data infrastructures were very much in flux. So new components were being added and others remained in the system. So it had a very sedimentary sort of quality to it. Um, so our first question was, um, you know, how can institutional protocols and procedures improve how platforms are used in schools um, and organisations? 
Our second question was really around how these platforms are reconfiguring teachers and, and administrators work, which kind of resonates with some of the questions that um, Irina and Juliana were asking as well. Um, and what we saw a lot was, you know, teachers really trying to kind of um, uh, reshape their practices in order to make what they were doing um, platform ready or platform visible. So another, the second question that we, um, that, that, sorry, the final question we had, um, which Bronwyn is now going to speak to is, um, how can we do this better? Because um, we're really interested in um, how we might work productively with teachers in the school um, to, to design platforms that are really more um, responsive to the teachers' needs. So I'm going to hand over to Bronwyn. Thanks, Lucy. I'll just stop sharing. Hold on a sec. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the second phase um, of the Data Smart Schools project, where we worked through some of the data challenges uh, teachers have described in our first part through all the interviews. So I'm going to focus on a single case at, sec um, at a secondary school we've called Western High. So Western's a relatively small government school in the inner city suburbs of Melbourne. It caters to 600 students aged 11 to 18 years. And there are around 60 teaching staff and 30 non-teaching staff working at the school. So we approached this process of designing a platform for teachers using participatory design or PD. So for those of you who are not familiar with PD, it can be distinguished firstly by an emphasis on establishing equitable partnerships with stakeholders through all stages of the design process, a focus on practice context as a starting point for design, a design method or methods that promote mutual learning and empathy between stakeholders, and also um, ensuring all the activities and outcomes directly benefit stakeholders. So increasingly researchers are recommending PD or co-design be used in the design of data platforms for schools so they better reflect the needs and practices of teachers. Um, however, we found that doing any kind of participatory work in schools is quite challenging. And I'm just going to briefly cover um, the details of, of some of the work that we did in Western. So our PD work can be summarised across three main phases, understanding data problems and the questions teachers were asking, mapping the data and data flows, and then co-designing the platform. So in this first phase, we worked closely with the data lead at the school who we'll call Michael. So Michael was a science teacher. He was also responsible for managing all student assessment and attendance data, which he did on an Excel spreadsheet. So teachers would reg regularly come to Michael with questions like, what are the students like in my class this year? What is their attendance like? Do I have students in my class that have particular strengths or areas that need improving? Are students improving as a consequence of my teaching? So Michael described two key challenges in his work. Firstly, issues with interoperability between platforms meant that his job was very fiddly and time consuming. So he had to extract data from multiple platforms that the schools had purchased and reformat it so it could be consolidated and analysed together on the Excel spreadsheet. Secondly, the time involved meant that this data work was inconsistent. So Michael could only find the time to do these in-depth analyses at certain times of the year, whereas teachers often wanted this information about students more regularly. So through this process, Michael wanted to design a platform that would assist him answer the questions teachers were asking by automating this work that he was doing, well, a lot of it, and analyzing and visualizing the data in a way that was useful and accessible to teachers. So we went ahead and engaged a programmer who was an expert in platform design. And we sat down together with Michael and mapped all the various types of school data that could contribute to answering the questions that the teachers were asking. And we came up with this map. So the middle column is the data. We have attendance data up the top, assessment data down the bottom. On the left, we have the various platforms where this data is housed. On the right, we have this new school platform that we were hoping to build. So attendance data um, up the top, is captured by teachers and staff at the school and housed in Compass. And this is the school's learning management system. So it was relatively easier, easy for our programmer to extract this data automatically from the LMS and transfer it to the new platform that we were designing. 
However, the assessment data was another story. If you look at the bottom middle column, we have a series of testing scores that are regularly used by teachers. So most of these tests are housed in external websites and it wasn't possible for our programmer to access this raw data or automatically extract it to the new platform. So what teachers had done previously was receive the test scores in a processed form. Michael would then reformat it so he could use it in his Excel spreadsheet. And so you can imagine the type of work that this involved. Um, finally, NAPLAN scores, which is down the bottom. This is a national testing process for students aged, uh, students in years three, five, seven, and nine. This data was stored in a database called Cases, and this is owned by the Department of Education. It's impossible to access. And the department sends out this NAPLAN data to the school each year, which Michael would then incorporate into his spreadsheet for analysis. So he'd spend a couple of days doing this each year. So we had all these high hopes to be able to extract all this data, automate it, consolidate it into our new platform for the school. But the only tech data that we could actually access was the attendance data and teacher judgment data that was collected in-house. Um, Michael also wanted to use the NAPLAN data in, and incorporate that into the platform because this data was only um, a single manual upload each year. It wasn't a huge amount of work in um, relative, relative work to all the other types of data that he has. So the third and final phase um, I want to touch upon is the co-design of the data platform itself and the challenge of doing this work in schools. So we needed input from other teachers with diverse needs and data literacies to ensure the platform we were designing would be useful. But finding teachers at the school to partner was quite challenging. So teachers wanted to be involved. They had been following our research and were really excited about it. However, they had very little time to participate. We booked in a workshop with teachers on a number of occasions over a four month period. And almost every time teachers would cancel on the day because other priorities had come up last minute. So they were making up classes for teachers who were sick, carrying out emergency meetings with parents, carrying out disciplinary activities, attending last minute staff meetings. So I wanted to mention this to speak to the challenge of doing participatory design work in schools. So even if you have the best intentions, the relationships, um, and you build the relationships and you bring the resources, schools are very chaotic places. They're immediate environments and time scarce and planning is hard. So even with all the flexibility, it was quite a challenge. Um, so in summary, designing platforms that meet the needs of teachers and reduces their data work from this case study is obviously important. However, co-designing a centralized platform is challenging on a technical level due to limitations to data access and issues with interoperability between platforms schools utilize. And also on a social level because teachers and staff in the school have so little time to reflect on how data and data platforms could be redesigned to meet their needs. So we have two recommendations um, for addressing these issues. Firstly, schools could have a dedicated data software developer in-house who we could work, who could work for the school, design platforms, carry out analyses for teachers. We could also think about the democratic procurement of software that allows schools to more easily access data so they can automate the data extraction and analysis process. So this would save the data, um, this would save the data leads a lot more time and also make data more accessible to the teachers. Um, so just finally, thank you. Here's a publication that Neil and I have put together that we wrote on doing PD in schools, which goes into these challenges and the complexities of schools in a lot more detail. Well, in there. Excellent. Thanks ever so much for that, Bronwyn and Lucy. I'm a bit biased because I have been involved in this project. But I mean, one of the things that Lucy was stressing there was um, infrastructure. Infrastructure matters. And the opposite of innovation is actually maintenance, which people never talk about when it comes to digital technology. And, and Bronwyn's research in terms of working with Michael, Michael was the data guy. Most of the schools we went to said, oh, you've got to speak to our data guy. And it's normally one teacher that can use Excel that's been burdened with doing data. And so even when we were working with these data kind of enthusiastic stuff, it soon became really, really obvious that you could not do very much with the software, with the systems, with the data. And the other thing I think which Bronwyn very um, elegantly glossed over was the the absolute nightmare it is that academics working with programmers and software developers we could write a whole book on wrangling software developers research that goes wrong now i'm a little bit biased because i have worked in this project so actually i've, I've sneakily asked Lindsay and yuliana to come up with a question each for for lucy and maybe promise so um Lindsay, first off hi hi lucy and uh bronwyn um thank you so much um that was 
so interesting and I, I think I've got about 10 questions for you um, but I, I will try I'll try and stick to one um, so I'm, I'm really intrigued about the kind of competing imaginaries of what data guys teachers researchers imagine platforms to, to be for and what, what they can achieve in schools. And one of the themes that seemed to come through both of your presentations was this um, perhaps a, a kind of dream of sort of a smooth interoperability that was foiled at almost every step that that people wanted. And, and that seems to be aligned to a to an idea of a, a much more efficient in terms of teacher labor, certainly, um, idea that that you know maybe data could just all be brought together and it could just all link up very nicely and be much more approachable and much more efficient and and I suppose I have a I have a sort of slightly provocative question which is is that always a good thing um, so um, I'm thinking about um, ideas of data friction um, uh, from Joe Bates at Sheffield and and the idea is that actually sometimes when things don't work smoothly there are more opportunities for individual agency to, to be exercised than when things link up almost too easily. Um, anyway, that's that's my slightly provocative question for you both. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I think um, I think you're right, and I mean, in many ways, um, the thing that you know we sort of were interested in is when these things recede into the background they become accepted they're not questioned so when things don't work it is actually a really good opportunity to look at why and perhaps you know what they were aiming for in the first place so I think um, that those moments are really important and certainly there was a lot of them I think we'd have to say that there was a lot of 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 friction um, so maybe the dream of hyperconvergence is um, which many of the teachers really spoke to is is just a kind of you know making things work but it's not I don't think um yeah I think that the schools that we worked in were far from achieving that but maybe that I guess the other thing to say there is that that's where we could perhaps intercede and try and improve things but maybe not through a, a convergence uh, sort of angle but through like looking at what they open up, you know, what the possibilities might be or how we could do it differently because they do kind of emerge from that un technological unconscious kind of sinking into the, the background. I don't know, Bronwyn, if you have anything to add. Nothing too much. Just when things did break down, teachers really start, that's when teachers started to have the conversations around the value of the data and what they were using it for. And so it was a good opportunity for that kind of social interaction and querying the, the data leads and the teachers who weren't the data teachers. So those kind of conversations between those different types of staff. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we were using the, the, the PD and the designing new data tools to kind of look for breakdowns, that kind of STS tradition of wait, waiting for things to break down and then stuff got interesting. But I think I got a sense that the data guys actually quite liked the frictions and breakdowns in the systems they were using because it allowed them to kind of do relational work. So there was one school where the guy, they were continually not getting, uh, they were missing data from particular subject areas. And then that allowed him to go and talk to those teachers and say, well, how's Johnny doing in year seven? And then he would enter some kind of spurious bit of data that reflected that conversation. So it allowed them to kind of work in relational ways under the radar of, of, of this amazing data system. It's fascinating. There's so much good stuff in documentation studies and STS and infrastructure studies. It's great. Juliana, did you have a, a question for, for Lucy? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Actually, the data friction bit came, came, it was one of the first questions that came up for me as well, because it's something that we realized as well, right? That the ministries, they want to basically smooth out, but actually data friction can be quite um, quite productive for schools are actually something that they want in, in terms of retaining data and they don't want data to leave the schools, so they make sure that the friction remains. So um, that's, a, that's a question whether to what extent you've experienced that as well, that um, data friction is actually something that schools pursue, right? So we play around with this concept of schools as data owner or data source, right? Understanding themselves as the owner of their data and having um, 
um, yeah, autonomy over their data and deciding what leaves and what doesn't, whereas the ministry looks at schools rather as a data source, which can be extracted. And so friction needs to be smoothed out. I'm one, um, I was also wondering in terms of the map that you've created, this um, school infrastructure map, to what extent you believe is possible to actually create these kinds of bird's eye view on the school. Because what we realized in our research was that whomever we talked to had a different view on the ways in which the infrastructure actually worked and how data was flowing. And in the end, we realized we can't really develop a comprehensive, you know, overarching view because it just seems impossible. Um, so that map was a very iterative mapping. It changed every time we spoke to someone. Someone had something to change, or that that piece of technology we don't use that anymore, or that's gone. You know, so there was it was quite a fun thing to make. And that relates actually to a question in the chat from Ted saying he's wondering how aware teachers and admins are of the transformation of the data infrastructures in their schools you're kind of hinting at the fact that they're probably not aware of the data infrastructure period, but to what extent is this notion of an ever-changing, glitchy, bodged together infrastructure actually, are teachers and admins aware of this? Um, I think for um, some of the platforms that we saw, they were, they were very aware of it, like particularly the platforms for learning, if we sort of break it down along those lines, teachers were well aware of the platforms for learning, but the more administrative platforms, unless they were um, offering something, you know, really um, new and i'm thinking neil of the the um what was it called smart the, the last thing the last platform that was revealed at one of our schools that was um about um being able to uh see students um what students were doing on the internet at any given time through a dashboard that was kind of given a big reveal you know almost in a sort of show like sort of moment but I think most of the administrative tools were kind of introduced and then perhaps forgotten or or, or sort of submerged um from when you've probably got more to add there too no okay <laughs> Excellent. I think that's what they call Hail Mary, don't they, in, in sports? Now, there's a whole bunch of comments in the chat, which um, Lucy and Bronwyn might have to attend to typing up. Um, and, and we will get back to them at the end as well. But I wanted to move on now to, to Lindsay. But just before I do, we've got Jenny Leonard, um, our live artist. Um, I'm going to say from Kent, Jenny. I'm not sure that's the truth, but you're in the UK at least. Um, so if we can spotlight what Jenny's done so far. <laughs> She's trying to leave some space for Lindsay. That's looking Hi, great. Um yeah, hopefully capturing just a bit of each uh, school. I really like this visual of uh, the data map being a patchwork that's stitched together by human labour, and there's a lot that sort of ties into there underneath, but that's a really nice visual um, of, yeah, housing and, you know, what we compete to as doing as people and what, what can be useful that systems make. So it's a nice topic to illustrate hopefully you get a bit of a visual mapping of this in my squiggly hand cursive so hopefully I won't be digitized I'll always have a job that there are jobs that hands can do and computers maybe can't yet but uh, absolutely yeah, and when, when whenever we well. ask artists to illustrate data it's the most unimaginative thing ever it's zeros and ones any book cover on this topic is the most <laughs> dull thing ever so if you want a decent book cover done get hold of Jenny <laughs> Right, we'll come go. back to Thank Jenny you. at the end to see how it's looking and it all gets coloured in and we'll share it with everybody. But in, in the meantime, we'll hand over to um, Dr. Lindsay Grant from the University of Bristol. As I said before, Lindsay has been researching this area for, for decades probably now, so she's a great person to have to chat. Um, over to you, Lindsay. Right. Thank you. Um, right. Can everyone see the screen and, and hear me OK? There we go. Right. Um, Okay, so yeah, thanks so much for the invite, and it's um, it's a pleasure to come and and share research on datafication in in schools, and and especially kind of to to dig into the details of these kind of empirically based research projects, which I still think there are very limited examples of these, even though some of us. Oh, thanks, Juliana. You can't see the screen. Hang on, right? Okay, better. Yep. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, second, second attempt. Yeah, so um, it, it's really fantastic to be able to, um, to, to, to kind of share these kind of empirical projects. So, um, as Neil said, um, the 
the field work for this research um, was conducted a little while ago in 2015. So um, to some extent, the infrastructures and the accountability um, systems have evolved. Um, but I think some of the underlying issues are, are very much the same um, in a lot of schools. So this, um, so I, I started working in um, a school in England um, with the very broad question of what, what does data do in schools? How does data act? Um, and can, coming at this from um, a perspective of thinking about data practices as a socio-material assemblage of material, semiotic and social flows and practices um, that don't just kind of measure and then represent what's happening in education, but perform what education actually is. So my research questions were, were thinking about how data actually comes to perform the thinking of education and the doing of education, what, what education actually actually is and how, how we practice it. Um, so the, the study itself was an ethnography um, in an English secondary school. There wasn't anything especially unusual about this school. Um, and I was trying to study uh, the, the social life of data, we might say. Um, so the school itself, um, suburban English secondary school, um, but I'm trying to think of the school not just as a kind of representative of other schools, but actually as a, a point within these kind of much wider networks um, of data practices that, that kind of flow into and out of the school itself. So this moment of networks of relations and understanding. So the data infrastructures don't just, they're not bounded by the school itself itself but they interconnect with international accountability systems with shifting policy making with discourses around media and technology um, and then my entry point into the school in a similar way was through um, what they what they it was the data office I'm not sure if you can read the uh, writing on the window here but they've scribbled on it welcome to the data office and this was um, I was surprised initially at the amount of resource that went into managing data within the school, that they had three members of staff in a dedicated office looking at um, data. Um, so in terms of how I then kind of worked, um, I was trying to follow the data as it came into and out of the data office. So thinking about the flows of data uh, that, that, that I could see, and clearly I couldn't see all of it, um, but through kind of three intensive periods of field work, I collected kind of volumes of field notes, interviews, photographs, documents. And, and what I really love about this kind of on the ground empirical work is that it enables you to engage with the kind of ambivalences and contradictions of data practices, rather than purely um, seeing data as this kind of all powerful, um, all encompassing, all determining force within schools that you can start to see where things kind of fall apart, as well as where things kind of come together. Um, so a little bit of background, just in terms of the data infrastructure within the school itself, um, they, they collected um, a huge volume of data, they collected pupil performance data at least six times a year, which they then had developed um, many of their own bespoke data processing systems, um, means of analysis and multiple different kinds of outputs. So, you know, talking about kind of mapping, um, this hand drawn um, picture on, on the left of the screen here is a map that was drawn for me um, by the, the lead teacher in the data office, showing the processes by which data were collected and, and the various different things that then happened to that data and what it was turned into. And one of the most striking outputs of this process was um, something that I started to call the pupil postcard wall, which is the image on the right here, which is um, individual pupils. Um, you can see their photographs blurred out there alongside uh, their, their data ranked. Um, so this, this was a ranking system. So the, the pupils um, whose postcards are at the top of the wall there were the highest priority for interventions. So that means taking them out of uh, mainstream classes uh, to give them booster classes uh, to try and improve their data. Um, and the school had actually developed their own kind of 
DIY algorithm for this calculation. You know, as we've been talking about already, um, you know, a lot of the kind of automated software is a bit of a myth. You know, there's a lot of um, DIY stuff going on as schools try and make things work. Um, and the teacher explained to me that the thinking behind um, this algorithm was it's, uh, it's about intervening with the right children. So in their terms, the right children um, it was a process of triage, so it was finding the children for whom a marginal improvement in their data would make the biggest impact on the school accountability measures. So uh, the algorithm was designed to prioritise students who were just below accountability measures rather than those who were so far below that they were probably never going to meet them. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the top level findings from my research and then kind of dig in a bit into some of the surprises and complexities. Um, so the first area in which kind of I saw education being reconfigured through data practices was around the curriculum. So um, this is fueling um, an intervention culture um, in which pupils were continuously taken out of mainstream classes, limiting their access, particularly to arts, particularly to sports, subjects that were seen as of lesser value in terms of their data. Um, so, so pupils who were triaged in this way um, automatically received a narrower curriculum. Um, and teaching itself also became orientated around the performance of assessment criteria as pupils were just continually um, formally tested. All of their lessons were practice um, about performing particular criteria. The second kind of broad area of, of reconfiguring education was around pupils' futures. So um, that postcard wall, um, that the, the algorithm, uh, the key ingredients there were uh, two different futures. So the target futures, the normative futures of what pupils should get and the predicted or forecast futures of, of what teachers thought children were going to get, bringing those together um, suggested uh, which children were falling short. So there was a, a whole infrastructure around the anticipation of people's futures and also attempting to optimise their futures through data. And some of the concerns around this would be that people's present moment starts to get overlooked. What's actually happening them, for them in the here and now is not as important as what will happen for them in the future. And it also resists asking critical questions about what kind of futures we might want for pupils, whether, they, whether those um, data futures that are being anticipated are either inevitable or in fact desirable. Um, and of course, it also forecloses any kind of futures that we might not have anticipated or we might not have predicted, which you know, we might argue is uh, quite fundamental to something being educational and not simply repeating um, what has gone on in the past. And then the third big area here is around teacher expertise and we talked a lot about kind of um, teacher labour and, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more um, but the kind of top level thing happening here was um, uh, one of the data office staff said to me you know that they had to explicitly tell teachers don't use your professional judgment use the actual number um, by which they mean the actual test result so that was produced as the only legitimate source of knowledge about pupils um, whereas uh, what, what they rather disparagingly called holistic forms of judgment where they might take it, where a teacher might take account of other ways of knowing about a pupil was seen as necessarily biased, um, whereas test results were obviously objective. OK, so though, that's my kind of whistle stop tour of the top three findings, but then um, like I said, with empirical research like this, I think it's always more fascinating to dig a bit deeper and you find things are not always as straightforward as they first appear. Um, so yes, there were um, there was anticipation of pupils' um, educational futures going on, um, but it wasn't all that straightforward. There were in fact multiple data futures being anticipated. So the two that I've mentioned already, which is this normative future of targets and this predictive future of forecasts, were mobilised through the pupil postcard wall. But there was also this third, um, less prevalent, but in some ways more interesting data future of, that, that was based on kind of probabilistic analysis. So looking at patterns across cohort data, which allowed 
teachers in the data office to express kind of windows or variations or variabilities of future outcomes, which could be more agnostic about where any one pupil might sit in that distribution pattern. So although I'm not arguing that this is, you know, uh, the, uh, a way of reinserting agency in, in these futures, there was room for a little bit more uncertainty um, and, and discussion here. And then what happened was that these different data futures then bumped into each other and intersected and produced quite contradictory and inconsistent results in that process. So what I saw was that teachers were being held accountable both for the accuracy of their predictions, they were being asked to forecast what a pupil would get and, and being held accountable for whether that forecast was accurate or not. They were also being held accountable for intervening in that future that they had predicted to change it so that the pupil would achieve their target. So this, they, they, there was a complete contradiction between that. There were also some strange inconsistencies when these probabilistic analyses were attempted to be folded back to make predictions at the individual level, which led to some very strange behaviour where teachers said, OK, I've got a pattern here and I don't know which pupil is going to be wearing this pattern. So I'm just going to randomly forecast different people so that I get the correct um, distribution pattern in my final data, um, which, which was rather counterintuitive. And there was also actually some little opportunities for resistance through data when the data office staff, whose whole reason was to um, promote the use of data throughout the school as legitimate and objective, actually used their own probabilistic data analysis to argue back to the school inspectors that it was extremely unlikely that all pupils could achieve the targets that, that the school inspectors thought they would. And they were actually successful in this. They managed to resist a negative judgment um, on their school um, through the use of data in this way that they saw as much more sophisticated than the use of data um, that the school inspectors were attempting to uh, uh, apply. Okay, um, so um, the, the other kind of level of complexity that I want to kind of share is around the kind of teacher expertise and teacher labour. And we've already had some really interesting um, conversations about this um, that I think the, these ideas kind of pick up on as well. So similarly to what, what Lucy and Bronwyn were, were discussing and Juliana and Irina was, you know, this, this kind of intimate engagement with data um, by the, the data guys and data girls um, in, in this school um, constantly having to create workarounds, constantly making on the fly decisions where the data systems could not encompass all the educational problems, challenges, decisions that were presented to them on a daily basis. Um, so there was always kind of an excess, there was always an excess of education that couldn't be included within, within their systems, but their uh, their involvement with the systems meant that they were constantly able to adapt um, and, and, and include more and more of education within their, within their uh, infrastructuring processes. And what I found was that there was this divide, and I think this echoes, echoes um, the, the data smart schools research between the kind of data elites or the data enthusiasts or data insiders um, who uh, amongst themselves were able to be quite open and critical about some uses and limitations of data, while at the same time presenting quite a simplified um, picture of what data says to, to those who were on the outside um, of that grouping. And what I think was happening here was um, not the simple story of kind of technical expertise displacing educational expertise, but a new kind of teacher professionalism that worked precisely because it integrated educational and statistical and technical expertise. So it's a new kind of um, professionalism being forged here that these weren't kind of developers or programmers or you know big tech coming in from the outside without any educational understanding. This worked in the way it did precisely because these were teachers who taught classes, um, who, who 
you know, had that expertise and that experience that they brought to what they were doing. Um, and at the same time, um, this actually expanded the influence and power of the data office staff within uh, within the school. So, um, as I said, they were constantly expanding the scope of what could be included within their kind of data systems approach um, so, and, and developing closed loop models. So they wanted to also collect data about the outcomes of their various interventions in order to feed back into um, the data system. So they, so they had a dream, I think, of, of encompassing increasing areas of school life within their, their systems approach. And, and in fact, expanding this beyond the school. So there they were entrepreneurial ambitions to say, actually, our approach can, uh, it is of value um, to other schools. Um, make, we can help you make data work for you. We can tame data. And I think there's uh, some interesting lines to follow there about, about people who can, who can do that for schools, who can, meld that educational and digital and data expertise and, and who are seeing value in it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there, um, but we were asked also to talk about kind of future research and I think um, kind of related to the question that I was asking Lucy and Bronwyn was, you know, what, what possibilities might there be for opening up to uncertainty and agency within data practices. So not necessarily resisting or refusing, but where are those cracks and contradictions and multiplicities and can, is, are there opportunities to intercede at, in those spaces? I think with empirical research, there's lots of opportunities to follow the data assemblage further. So I was based in a school and things were coming into and going out of the school, but I think there's more opportunities to, to actually follow that data into those other spaces. Um, and I also think that um, I'd like to see more research about these kind of data intermediaries and, and entrepreneurs. And that also links quite nicely with some of the stuff that Juliana and Irina were saying about the role of intermediaries. So I think that's an important layer that perhaps uh, could do with more attention. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks ever so much for that, Lindsay. Really, really interesting research, really, really interesting insights. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions and comments in the chat, which we might have to attend to some of them typing, but there's, there's three things um, which I think come up recurrently. First of all, you've painted a really kind of positive perspective on teachers kind of retaining a sense of expertise and judgment and taming data as you say mm -hmm. not being driven by the data but developing new forms of professionalism that allows them to kind of work with the excesses of education that can't be datafied in some ways that's a really kind of hopeful way forward and leads to a whole bunch of kind of ways of thinking that how data might work in realistic terms there's a comment in the chat from Evelyn who's making the point that actually so much data has been generated about the communities and relations within schools that if you kind of really dig down and got all the data together, you might be able to kind of gain some really new surprising insights about the ways that. So by kind of taming data to fit schools and school logics, are perhaps schools missing out on, on some real genuine benefits that people don't actually haven't actually kind of thought of yet? Or are they right? To, or should we really be kind of encouraging schools to kind of act in this way of a kind of data tamer? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things that um, is is tricky to struggle with in this kind of research is, um, you know, taking this sort of infrastructure studies approach, looking at what happens and how it works in schools, but also being aware of the limited opportunities for agency within very strong accountability frameworks that that exists, you know, in the UK, um, well, England. Um, I always have to be careful because Scotland and Wales have different education systems. Um, uh, but also Australia, I think, has a very strong accountability system. Um, and and to what extent you can, uh, what what is the scope for manoeuvre around data practices within that larger policy framework? So the question about kind of, uh, what genuine insights could be made, I, I think is a really important one because you can imagine that given these, the expertise within this school, if they were freed from the accountability frameworks to which they have to uh, 
report and, and which shape so much of their work, then this data could become not the answer to intervening to meet those thresholds, but it could become the start of um, new forms of inquiry. You know, it, so rather than data being the answer, the data shows you the questions you need to be asking. Um, and, and that, I think, would be a hugely kind of more powerful way of thinking about data. And I think that kind of, um, you know, the, the rise of the data tamers are, are kind of the, the intermediary that helps schools, you know, deal with push back on the accountability layer. Um, so it, it's, it's tricky to sort of disentangle those two. Um, I, no, yeah, I, and I, I, yeah. I don't know whether it's something that teachers in Australia are, kind of, are trained, but every school we went into, every teacher said data is the start of a conversation. It's never the answer. And that really got into their heads. And so data was always used as the beginning of inquiry. A question from or questions from Alice Bradbury and Sue Cramner, names that are familiar to you, I'm sure. They, they were very interested in how teachers feel about data. Did, did you get a sense of emotional attachment to particular types of data? Mm. Affect. Um, Affect, yeah. So um, I think it's important to recognise uh, there is a lot of diversity amongst teachers. So, you know, we, we might sometimes like to imagine that, you know, teachers are all kind of, you know, educationally, you know, uh, mistrustful of these rather reductive ways of thinking about learning. And actually, some of my teachers loved it. They really loved it. Um, it, it gave them power in the school. Um, it gave them security to know that they were doing, I think one of my English teachers said, you know, well, th this is, if you're not doing this, you're not teaching English as the government wants it to be taught. So, you know, it gave him a feeling that he was doing his job properly. Um, other teachers were, I, I can't say I found any, any pockets of, you know, real resistance or refusal. I think other teachers were just uh, that's just part of the job it's just routine you know it's just what I do you know it's not my favorite bit um, it's not something I get excited about but it's it's necessary and you know that's just the background to what I do so uh, there was diversity in uh, in how classroom teachers uh, engaged engaged with data but the fact that um, th there's also kind of some research methods things here, which is that I didn't speak to every single teacher in the school. Um, my access to teachers was mediated via the data office. Um, so there may have been pockets of resistance <laughs> that I didn't access. Um, and the fact that the data office teachers um, went to the trouble of telling me how they had told other teachers off for using holistic judgments <laughs> suggests that, you know, there were at least some pockets of teachers who were who were um more critical of of these systems one of the interesting things about working in australia is you get lots of teachers that have previously taught in the uk come over to work in australia so some of our teachers refer to data as the english disease uh there's another quote we had saying we don't want to get like the uk and where we just track them like robots so it might be a particularly english uh kind of kind of predilection um lucy you had a question for Lindsay just to finish off um, before we go to the, the wider q &A. Um, yeah, thanks, Lindsay. That was fascinating. Um, you know, so many questions, but I mean, it was interesting to see all the this, this stuff of data as well, like not just the digital, but those boxes and, and profile um, pictures on the wall. That was quite extraordinary. But um, one thing that I was interested in um, is, um, I guess, how persuasive these platforms are to teachers and how sort of shaping they are of the ways in which the teachers began to see data because, you know, by the very act of actually using these systems, you sort of have to kind of go with it, if you like. You have to kind mm -hmm. of understand data. So I was just interested in whether you kind of noticed, um, like, teachers kind of being, sh you know, um, shifting their position on data as they became, you know, to use particular platform in, in those schools. Mm. Um so I think, I mean, there was one of the things that was quite interesting was when teachers were able to question data and kind of hold it at a distance and, and when they were not. So 
when I sat, I sat with teachers. So my, I did my interviews with classroom teachers while they were doing data entry. And I sat next to them while they were typing into their spreadsheets and just getting them to talk through the whole process and, and their understanding of what was going on. And at that moment in time, um, they had so many questions about what that data meant how valid it was how reliable it was you know that this this expected target for this pupil is totally unrealistic but it's going to come up red when i type this number in you know this kid was having a blinder of a day here we're comparing one bit of the curriculum with another bit of the curriculum so to call that progress doesn't make sense because it's actually on different content you know there were lots and lots of really critical questions about the about the use of data at that moment mm. That data then came back to them sometime later after having been processed by the data office in a report with a list of names of pupils um, who they had to kind of work on, you know, so it's this kind of very interventionist approach. Um, and at that point, those questions just were as if they didn't, yeah. they'd never occurred. Mm -hmm. So it changed depending on kind of how the data was kind of presented and what it was brought into relation with. Um, yeah, so mm. it was, it, it shifted. And similarly, the data office complained about some teachers arguing with them and saying, why is this kid on this list? Um, and, and getting cross because the data office felt, well, that's your data you are responsible for that data. So what we've done with it is just, you know, nothing. But, of course, you know, they had, they processed it, they put it together with other data, they turned it into lists of pupils. Um, but, but they couldn't see why teachers would then question that data when they should have ownership of it in their view. So there was a lot of mm. tensions going on in at what point data was seen to be determining and at what point it was, you were able to kind of question data mm. the data office sound terrible <laughs> anyway I'll, I'll that's probably park that there Every, excellent thanks ever so much for that Lindsay. that's super fascinating we've got five minutes left just before we finish with a big final question i just want to pitch back to jenny just to see where she's got to um she seems to have filled in most of the paper how's it going hi yeah all good so i think there were some really nice things that come out in the last thing i like this idea of following the data so i've done it as kind of like a a river and these are the, i think three things part of it so we've got this bit built into there but obviously so much information i could probably make about 10 drawings about all of this uh stuff but i tried to keep it to the highlights so there's a little bit from everyone but thanks for having me it's been really interesting Oh, brilliant. Thanks ever so much. Yeah, we, we were talking to a load of data scientists that were banging on about data lakes. So water and data seems to be a, a definite thing. Oh, now, there's been lots that would and lots... Be a great thing to illustrate. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't want to go there. Now, there's been <laughs> loads of names in the chat of very familiar faces, researchers around Europe and, and um, Australasia who are really kind of working in this area in many different directions. So hopefully these are conversations we can carry on with after this event but just to finish off given that there are so many academic researchers kind of on the call i just wanted to finish off by asking maybe juliana and um lucy and arena um the question that lindsay finished on so lindsay talked a lot about future research directions from the, from your three perspectives what are the big research questions or topics or problems or approaches that we need to be grappling with now next as academic researchers we've kind of mapped out the landscape and shown how messy it is what are the big things that academic researchers need to do over the next five years juliana first off thank you yeah i think actually what eve asked in terms of data feminism is a direction and, and feminist theorists and thought is actually something that is really useful and productive in terms of exploring how these kinds of data systems um, impact on the life worlds of different groups of people um, and to explore these kinds of um, concepts further in, 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 in trying to think through how you know, these kinds of systems create new invisibilities, um, new inequalities um, or strengthens existing ones. And I found a quote by Dan McQuillan, who wrote a really, really good book on resisting AI, who said, actually, we don't need to teach data literacy, but feminist literacies. 
right? So not to think so much about how these data infrastructures work, but actually how they are impacting on the lives of people. So, for example, how they are shifting responsibilities to individuals rather than, you know, and making basically structural um, inequalities invisible by putting accountability and responsibility to individuals. So I thought that was really powerful. And that's something that I keep on thinking in terms of how we can shed more light um, on these um yeah on these um dynamics and i think that uh, relates really nicely back to also what bronwyn and lucy uh, bronwyn in particular said about participatory design and engaging different types of educational actors i mean there is this argument about the tyranny also of participation right everybody needs to participate and how uh, and how you can't really engage everybody and make everybody's wishes um become um real but I think that's certainly the future to, to, to open up design processes to become more democratic and inclusive. Excellent. No, that's a really good set of points. I was on a call yesterday, an online webinar with Dan McQuillan when he was spruiking his book, and he's one of the yeah. best speakers I've ever seen. I was in, in awe. Mariana, any any final big questions? Or I'm, I'm just trying to get ideas for future research projects myself, really. But where are you going next with all this? Was it to me or to you? Yeah, Daniel? sorry. Yes, I, th I thought you were not going to give away your, your secret. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would second you there under the feminist uh, perspectives and participatory research. So thank you also, Bronwyn and Lucy, for your presentation on participatory methods. And But what I think also what we've been talking about today with data infrastructures is uh, also something quite important, especially how we were, we were talking about the workarounds and frictions and the, the labor going into making the data. And I think that's also quite important to show more of that labor and um, on different steps and also show here again, seconding this feminist idea of how that also shifts in visibilities and power. So just show more of this actually invisible labor and also of these breakdowns and how does that actually make up the most part of our engagement with data, just repairing the breakdowns and trying to mend the infrastructures all the time, over and over again. Excellent. Yeah, I think those are, again, really important things. And, and last of all, Lucy, you've just won a really prestigious three-year research fellowship to do this. So well done. But also, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I was going, I really echo what um, Juliana and Irina have um sort of outlined, I think the kind of pressing thing is looking at um, how data really intensifies these issues of social justice um, in schools. I think, um, you know, really understanding the short and long-term implications for students and teachers as well, like how does this stuff matter? Um, so the project is partly looking at that. Um, but I think to kind of make those implications clear to stakeholders is the kind of key to change because until we sort of know what the impact is, um, it's hard to, to get that kind of momentum, um, you know, the impetus to change. But I think um, the other thing that I'm interested in looking at is the kind of broader data ecology. So, you know, the work we've done in the Data Smart Schools has looked, you know, really closely at the local context, but actually to kind of take a step further out and look at how the school has become, you know, is a part of a sort of bigger um, picture um, and trying to find out the different sort of actors um, outside the school that are kind of driving data in the school. So not just, um, you know, uh, education departments, but also, you know, d data brokers and um, various professional networks as well, um, which is what we're seeing in Australia too. So seeing that broader ecology, I think, could be useful and important. excellent yeah no that's that's a, a big rabbit hole to go down well thanks ever so much we've covered a lot and answered very little but hopefully kind of given everyone lots of food for thought real big thanks to everyone that's participated it's been really really interesting we should definitely do this again we will send a link to the video and a link to jenny leonard's art once it's all done to everyone that registered um, and we just hope these are conversations that we can carry on over the next few years. Thanks ever so much. It's getting very late here in Australia, so it's time for bed. Have a great day uh, if you're in Europe um, and see you all soon. Thanks again.